Yeah, so we're heading up to the final section of <clears throat> accidental death of a maniac. Um, starting with this first question here, how do the Brechtian elements involved in the maniac stage direction on page 50 reveal the, reveal the universal willingness to be deceived? So, <clears throat> we're looking then at this section from the middle towards the bottom. It says after Felletti has arrived, the constable, um, sorry, the maniac is outrageously costumed. He wears false mustache, glasses, wild wig, wooden leg, false hand, eye patch, and carries a crutch. He's delighted and offers his false hand. They stare at his wooden leg and gives it a slap. But his overt performativity here draws attention to the way that the what well, draws the journalist, Felletti, into the willingness to be deceived. And the important thing to bear in mind is that that's for the sake of her own story. That's why she is willing to participate or to collude in this sort of illusion that the maniac is partly constructing um, in this part of the scene. So there's, it's always worth bearing in mind that whilst Felletti is principled and not at all like the police, she is... Um, willing to, to see reality in a certain fashion that allows her to construct a story. The second question, how does the dialogue centred on the maniac's eye symbolically underline his participation in the deception, I should say, actually, in the deception? It's unfolding with Filetti. So we're looking there at page 51. <clears throat> now, what we see here in this exchange, the maniac um, being slapped on the back by the superintendent. Maniac slapped on the back by the superintendent. He says, mind the eye. Eye, it's glass. You'll knock it out. Oh, sorry. Now, one of the things that's important with the, with the eye itself is that it, it, it functions as, <clears throat> obviously, the selective vision of reality that everyone is willing to both... Um, construct themselves and also um, sort of collude in. You know, the, the selective vision of reality is what we see through this. But actually, in many cases, the fact that it's part of a costume, it's part of deception, reveals the way in which um, our realities that we see are contingent upon this sense of unreality in, in deception. So the maniac here is involved in, in, in a deception itself, even though his own um, costume and props that are part of this costume draw attention to the fact that reality itself is selective. So number three, in spite of its fanciful excesses, the police willingly embrace the maniac's improvised story to Filetti on 52 to 53. What does their reaction to the story reveal about the truth itself and how is the maniac's loss of his false eye connected to this particular meaning? So, <clears throat> we flip over to 52 and 3. Now, <clears throat> the fact that um, the maniac comes up with this fabricated story that involves actually the police enacting kind of brutality on, on the suspect. The suspect was partially paralyzed by the blow and had momentary difficulty breathing um, and manages to come to this final realization. That actually, he's at this point, you know, they've, he's, as he says, it's often the case in such events. Each of the officers thought the other had the stronger hold, you know, this sort of thing. To me, Giacomo, okay, that's history. And whoops, out he goes. What more can you say? So at this point, we're, we're looking at this and thinking, well, actually, <laughs> the story itself indicts them and, and, and it is a critique, but the superintendent and Pisania behold this explanation because it does explain the nature of the body's fall. And they're in this sort of moment of aesthetic contemplation here at the Maniac's supposedly brilliant storytelling story capacity here and the way it reflects positively <clears throat> on um, what, what's gone on here with the, with the anarchists. 
But then what happens with the eye is an important symbolic commentary on what's going on here. The, the maniac is slapped on the back by the superintendent here and you hear this loud plop and he's, fuck me, what did I tell you? It's gone, what? And then the maniac says, the eye's out, everybody down. The constable, the superintendent and Pisani crawl around looking for the eye. And we see here is that the, the complete loss of um, a kind of solid ability to locate truth of any description. It gets lost in this performance. You know, the fact that the police are all happy to go along with this completely fabricated story shows us that the truth itself has been buried within that um, willingness of, of the police to go along with this story. And they're desperate, clutching around looking for it. Shows us how they're willing to cling on to any form of deception as long as it in some way exonerates them from blame. <clears throat> Examine Batozza's entry on the scene 54, which shares the effects of Commedia's Lazzi. How is he equated with the maniac? And how does this characterization connect to the theme of malleable truth? Examine the stage directions at the bottom of the scene for symbolism connected to the themes of truthfulness. The contrast between the bomb and the eye symbols is key to this. So we're looking here at Batozza's entry 54. <clears throat> now, when we talk about the eye, the first that's worth mentioning is that it's see-through and transparent. And so there is a suggestion that the, the performativity that it symbolizes is very obvious, and yet people are willing to, in many ways, sort of swallow that sense of its performativity. There's a knock at the door, and it's Batozzo coming in. And the door bursts open and sends the constable flying. It's Batozzo, he holds a, a, a metal package, and he also wears an eye patch. Now his iPad is obviously logically because of his violent treatment earlier on in the scene at the hands of the superintendent, but it also suggests that his vision is obscured. And then the lines carry on. Ah, but also, I'm sorry I'm interrupting. I just came to deliver this. What is it? My nose. And the constable says as if, as if all of them are made of, of false body parts, but actually it's just because the door's banged into his nose. Um, a little further down. It says it's too late to retrieve the eye before it's stepped on by Batozzo on his way back to the desk. It sends him flying as he goes, as his legs go from under him, the bomb flies up in the air. So he's brought in this reproduction bomb, which in many cases is supposed to um, symbolize the explosive reality that the maniac is trying to expose. But then Batozzo is hurt at the same time by the truth or the false versions of it that the eye symbolizes. So there's a suggestion here that each of these layers of performative deception are in some way endangering each other. The maniac catches the bomb and then Pisani grabs the eye. That connection to Batozzo is extended over the page. The Batozzo is looking at the maniac saying that he, he sort of recognizes him. And then the maniac just says that'll be because we've both got bandaged eyes. So the suggestion there is that he's actually unable to see, and the fact that there are sort of different versions of the same thing here. They're both engaging in performance, and they're both having, both deliberately draw attention to their obscured vision. Now, at the bottom of 56, the eyes again used symbolically to reflect on the theme of truthfulness. So what we want to know then is how is the collusion of the police and the reality of the truth revealed in these symbolic stage directions and lines. So we're looking at, at the bottom of 56. So what we see at the bottom of 56 then, the superintendent winking and the maniac drops the eye in a glass of water and shakes it. And Sonny says, see, how do you do? The toss of his gagger, they shake hands, the maniac swallows his eye like a pill. And so the suggestion here that this swallowing of the eye itself suggests that it's in some way a cure for a disease in that simile. And I think it exposes the police's willingness to swallow whichever convenient version of the truth happens to um, present themselves, present itself to them. So we've got this sense of complicity and, and collusion in, in the willing um, consumption of the truth here, the willing consumption of, of a version of the truth that the symbolism involves. 
On 58, it says, Faux creates a huge sense of tension by contrasting the symbol of truthful revelation with deception and collusion. And what is the maniac's role in creating this tension? So we're looking then at page 58. Before we do so, I just wanted to point out something on page 57 here. That the discussion of Filetti around the bomb reveals that the bomb and its explosive revelation that it symbolizes. There's also a revision and a reproduction buried in layers of artifice like the the maniac's deception tactics themselves. So the bomb in some way reveals that sort of explosive revelation that is itself compromised by the fact that it um, it itself is, is an artificial performance. Now, we come back to 58. And we look here towards the bottom. The maniac speaks to Miss Filetti here. He says, you see here, Miss Filetti, a bomb like this is complex. Tons of wire in there. Always a good sign. Now, now this here is a priming device. Could even be a double timing priming device. Some form of acid booby trap. We just don't know, you see. And the superintendent of resorts also says, sounds like an expert, eh? Could take a day dismantling the first phase. Meanwhile, boom! And he tosses the bomb in the air and everyone screams and dives for cover, and he catches it. Now, there's a great deal of irony involved in, in, in this moment here. Because what you see here is this contrast between the symbol of re, you know truthful revelation and his deceptive performance as a ballistics expert, which, again, destabilizes the truth and proves that the truth itself is buried within these layers of performativity, that the truth itself is malleable and and unreliable in many ways. So the truth itself is being lost in the performativity of this final act and scene in the play. Question seven, how does Batozza's confession on 59 reveal the complicity of the state and the far right in the bomb attacks? So Batozza's confession on 59 is, is a crucial part of this. So here, the maniac says, it's better to lose the evidence than risk the added carnage, don't you agree? And he manages here to convince Folletti of the, the moral argument by actually deceiving her. And she says, I'm convinced. And later on, Downey reveals this deception by saying, I've even convinced myself, not bad, eh? So he shows us that Folletti's not herself completely um, against or... Sort of resistant to this idea of deception as long as the story that she gets high, it, it sort of suits her own needs. The superintendent shakes the maniac's hand and it comes off and then he snatches it back and screws it on again. So this highlights again their willingness to be in some way excused by a sham performance. But then to, towards the bottom they, they're discussing the nature of the bomb and Folletti gives away the fact that uh, sorry, asks a question that Batozza responds to and gives away the sense of collusion between the military and the government with the perpetrators of the bombing. Because Folletti then asks Batozza, it's a military man, and he says, more than likely. And so Folletti says, notwithstanding knowing that to handle, let alone make bombs of this kind, probably requires military skill. You completely ignored all other avenues of investigation and concentrated your efforts on the most pathetic and disorganized groups of anarchists in Italy. And so again, it shows further the further limitations of their professionalism and the fact that they have this evidence that the bomb has been made by someone with military expertise and have focused all of their efforts on disorganized left-wing sort of anarchist groups. And so this revelation that Batozzo has accidentally undergone here is, is involved with the complicity of the military and potentially the government at the highest possible levels of this um, individual political scandal. We go back to six, uh, question eight. And how does the stage direction with the maniac's hand at the bottom of page 60 reflect the nature of the interrogation with Folletti at this point? So at the bottom of page 60, the maniac shakes Folletti's hand and Folletti says, thank you. And then Batosa says, he's getting up my nose. And the maniac's come, hand comes off in Folletti's. And she says, oh, your hand. And he says, keep it, I've got a spare. So here again, this implies... His complicity in the process of performance and deception, but the fact that he reveals this performativity to Filetti, and she um, is is quite happy to go along with this symbolic sort of agreement about the maniac's performance. Again, 
complicates the extent to which we can see her as the defender of truth. We then come back to 62, which marks the end of the maniac's collusion with the police, and in what ways has he used their own weaknesses against them, and how are these aspects of his role revealed on this page. So we're going to take a, a look through the lines leading up to this on page 61. Pisani and the superintendent stand on a foot each. The maniac then produces another hand, elegant, elegant and manicured. And this deliberately links Felletti to the performance and that shows that her story is just another angle on this reality and a layer of deception to encase the truth within. But he then screws the hand on and Felletti throws the hand over her shoulder in revulsion. It lands in the filing cabinet as the constable is closing his drawer and his fingers get mashed. So again, you've got this sense here of her in some way being horrified by this one version of the story that in the end damages the police. And again, the stage directions here and the kind of comic um, farce involved in the stage performance here is giving us this sense of um, the way that the police are endangered by this. And Folletti's holding them to account here with some questions about, you know, the, the, the political associations involved in, in the bombings and, and asking them why they haven't checked out the kind of the right wing extremists. And the maniac calls these provocative tactics that Miss Folletti is using, which is ironic because they're sort of damning facts being described as provocative. And we see then the maniac performing support for them. The maniac then says, are you trying to get us to admit that instead of chasing idiotic anarchists and relying on informers and agents inside the revolutionary left, we should be concentrating our efforts on paramilitary fascist organizations trained and supported by, say, the Greek junta and financed by top industrialists, both here and in Spain? The superintendent lies a popping, which is obviously revealing the, the way in which he's, he's articulating the truth. And in his, and in his other lines where he, he manages to articulate the true nature of the sort of collusion with the extreme right. What we see here is that in each of these exchanges here, he portrays the actual truthful logic. And even though here in disguise, they almost seem ludicrous. So the fact that he, at this moment in time, is posing as a supporter of the police is what makes the truth here seem farcical. So where usually he's offering farcical representations of reality, here he's offering a, a very truthful, blunt explanation of the collusion between the government and the far right. And yet, at this point in time, it seems almost ludicrous because he's um, pretending to be a sort of supporter of what's going on with the police here. So... This is the sort of moment that this ends for them. And Batozzo circles on the maniac and looks at him from all angles as if he's an exhibit. So there's this strange um, sense of him as an aesthetic artifact to be sort of by Batozzo. And I think it's just as a result of his own, um, his own sense of honesty here that, that Batozzo just can't quite work him out and is mesmerized by the maniac in these lines because he is so directly honest and because he is so surprised by this so we get further than this and it asks us on page 63 how does their handling of Batozzo on 63 re reflect their absolute adherence to the principle of convenient truths what we see with Batozzo on 63 is the following superintendent tells Batozzo that he's a madman as he um, tries to reveal the true nature of the maniac here. He's the one that's realised. And he says, I won't shut up. And they jump on him, cover his mouth, while they all um, wrestle him to the floor. The maniac continues with his revelation of, of, of their political corruption, oblivious to what they're saying. And so here, again, this is concealing the truth of the maniac's identity for their own safety and convenience. But then further down, the maniac has an exchange with Filetti that, is importantly revealing about Foe's politics. So what we see in this question, it says, examine the maniac's lines on 63 and how do they reveal Foe's political views and how um, do they reflect on the purpose of the comedy? So we're thinking here about what the maniac says in these lines and how they reflect on the purpose of Foe's writing. So if we take a look here, the views that he articulates are these. You're a journalist, Miss Folletti. 
So you want to use your pen to lance the public boil, but what will you achieve? A huge scandal? A heap of big knobs compromised, head of the police force shunted off into retirement. It's just another chance for the pristine beauticians of the Communist Party to point out another wart on the body politic and pose themselves as the party of honesty. But the state, Miss Folletti, the state remains still presenting corruption as the exception to the rule when the system the state was designed to protect is corruption itself. Corruption is the rule. So we see a, a quite a clear articulation, I think, at this point of foe's politics as it attempts to show complicity between the state and the corrupt um, because the state itself is supposed to lose credibility by virtue of the of the exposure of this complicity. And so what we see in Foe's politics then is a kind of anti-statism, a, a suggestion that the state itself is there to underpin the forces of corruption. And so the you know where where the maniac is is hostile to Folletti because he argues that she's looking for a scandal and that people will be sort of hung out to dry in public for that scandal. But in the end, that's still going to enable um, the state to carry on functioning and for the scandal to actually function almost like theatrical catharsis. It's going to remove the anger of the body politic. And that's precisely the opposite of what Foe is searching to do in this play is to keep that um, sense of anger sort of simmering through the exposure of the reality of this state-level corruption. We're looking there for the switches in tone across page 64 and 65 that occurs as the main, alongside the maniac's sober political meditations, alongside this sort of farcical lazzi of the police, this sort of comic slapstick from Commedia. So you think, why is it important in terms of Foe's conviction in the political value of comedy that he makes use of this juxtaposition? And what does it reveal about the purpose of political comedy? in opposition to the scandal that the maniac is vilifying. So if we look at these exchanges here, across 64 and 5, what we see is the maniac offering a, a kind of political tirade about class discrepancy and the way the state is involved in exploitation in these lines across the pages. And so what we see is this great serious political discussion punctuated by these ridiculous moments of slapstick here. There's moments of fast like this one where they launch themselves at Batazzo, he falls to the ground, they all end up on the ground, they chase him off through the door. Then further down here, there's this lazzi like comedy at this moment where Batazzo ends and sees the maniac and the maniac just sends him out the other way. So there's this farcical physical comedy going on the stage and it's continued here with the superintendent and Pisani are chasing Batazzo and he keeps directing them on and off the stage. They provide an ironic contrast to these sober ideological reflections that the maniac is offering us here. And we have this huge sense of um, inversion, where the, the supposedly crazy one is the one that is offering the sobering political reflection, the ideological discussion. And those entrusted with the protection of our rights and our, and our, our safety as citizens are the ones engaging in this sort of farcical comedy. And so Foe's use of juxtaposition here is part of that, that, that effort to make comedy the exposure of, of tragic realities that in some way leave the audience with this simmering sense of rage.